Welcome back again for our Wednesday night Bible study in the book of Romans. This will be the 22nd of July, and we're looking at Romans chapter 2. Uh, first of all, let me share a couple of personal things with you. I hope that you continue to study these scriptures on your own. There will be occasions when I may say something that's not correct. Now, there are some things in scriptures, if you look at different study Bibles and commentaries, you will see there's different opinions about. If it's an opinion, I would try to tell you my opinion rather than strictly what the scripture uh, obviously indicates or what many people say it indicates. But there will be occasions where I'll, I'll misspeak probably. In fact, as I was going over uh, my past broadcast, I noticed that uh, when I talked about the people in Rome, where, the, where they came from, I said that perhaps they were some who had scattered, or not scattered, but who left after the day of Pentecost, after the day of Pentecost. But I said Passover. I don't know why I said that. It just came out that way. It must have been a senior moment. So you need to read the Bible and check. Uh, indeed, these people may have left at Passover, uh, excuse me, Pentecost, and gone to Rome, or perhaps they left after the stoning of Stephen. Don't know for sure how they got there. Just know that they end up, these people end up being in Rome. And then again, at the end of the book of Romans, we'll talk about a bunch of different people who evidently were already there that God, that Paul sent Greetings to. So I just wanted to remind you that you know, please check this out. If you ever have any comments or, or concerns about anything I've said, you, you certainly may uh, call the church office at 776-4212 and ask to speak to me. I do my very best. Uh, to address whatever issues you would have. But tonight, if you would, go ahead and find the second chapter of the book of Romans, and we're going to look at the remainder of that chapter, verses 17 through 29. And so let me read, and then we'll discuss the verses as we go. Well, first of all, a little bit of review, I guess. Last session, we saw that, that just because uh, some of the Jews have the law doesn't necessarily mean that they obey the law, and uh, obedience is a result of the hard attitude and, and uh, certainly we don't want to be accusing people of doing things wrong that we're doing ourselves. And this was the case of many of the Jews at this point in time, it appears. So Paul continues this discussion, and you'll see as we go through this how it definitely appears that he's addressing more the Jewish people uh, than the Gentiles. Verse 17 through 20, we have these words. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, because it says specifically Jews right here, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have this law in the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Now, he's giving you a whole list of ifs here. He's saying, now, you're a Jew, and this is things you are claiming for yourself. When you claim to be a Jew, by birth or uh, circumcision, uh, coming a part of the nation. It says, you're God's favorite people, you say. The law you were given is your justification, proof of this indeed, uh, that you are God's favorite people. And that your insight of things is certainly superior to others because God dealt with you as his favorite people. And uh, because of your superior knowledge uh, in, uh, in uh, blessing of God upon you, the desire to use you, you certainly must be a great model. And then he says, so with ifs, there's always a then. And this is what he continues to say. Now, if this is true, then there ought to be some results. So verse 21 through 23, he takes him to task. He says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So basically he's saying here, if this is true, you say about yourself, why, and you talk this way, why do you not walk your talk? Why do you not do the things you say uh, that you're capable of doing or should be doing or represent before God? And he lists several specific things. If you look through the, the Bible, in many other instances, Paul or Jesus will list a bunch of other things. God himself will list a bunch of other things 
that are specific sins. But, but here he mentions uh, about stealing, about committing adultery, uh, about benefit from un ungodly places like uh, where they used to have the idols and people would bring their treasures and their stuff. Somebody knows you benefit from that. Uh, breaking the laws, you tout, and you benefit from those things. But why do you do these things if indeed you claim to be God's special people? Uh, you're not a very good example at all. And I would say, again, as we've mentioned before, that today, this is exactly what people, many people who are not Christians say about Christians. If you say these things are wrong, well, why do you do that? Why are you dishonest? Why do you have many divorces? Uh, why, why is there adultery going on? Well, why do you, why you benefit from ungodly enterprises that go around, you know, investing in stocks and, and companies that, that promote evil of some sort, tobacco or alcohol or whatever kind of thing. Well, why do you try to benefit that? Why, why don't you stand up against it? But yet, that's not what we do. We break the same laws that we tout others should abide with according to God's word. So verse 24, he says, it says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, in the Ten Commandments, there is a commandment that says we should not take God's name in vain. That can be a verbal taking his name in vain, but also can be a life where one person says, I am a Christian, and then by the life he lives, he totally goes against what God says we ought to be like. And because of that, when people say Christian, look at us, they think, well, God must not be who he is. So we blaspheme him because of the way we live. And that's what these Jewish people that Paul was saying that they're doing what they need to be careful not to do. All right? Uh, verse 24, it says, As it is written, God's name is blasphemed because of the Gentiles, uh, uh, because of you. Now, we go back to Romans 1.32, and again, it says that all, Christ, all people who know who God is have some kind of, uh, of revelation from him, the general revelation. But again, each of us do influence people directly or indirectly, positively or negatively. And so we are always to uh, influence them in a positive way, not a negative way. Verse 25 through 27, it says circumcision has value. And again, they were the people of God, the Jewish people, were supposed to be circumcised as a mark that they were his people. Not, not the only group of people in the world that ever were circumcised, but they all were specifically supposed to do that as a mark of obedience to him. Uh, circumcision has value if if you observe the law but if you break the law you have become as those who are not circumcised in other words you say you're a Jewish Jewish person to love God but but the way you look and you're marked that way but the way you live indicates that you really are not you're, you're fake you're false if those who are not circumcised keep the commandments will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised circumcised and the one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a law breaker. Now here, here's an illustration, I think, that explains what he's talking about. Uh, you read in history many times, there were leaders who were noble leaders, and they had sons and daughters after them who had a title and a position, uh, yet they were not anywhere near like their predecessors. They were not noble. They were ignoble. Maybe total opposite. And reading the Bible is the same way. Some of the kings uh, who were faithful to the Lord, their sons who took over after them were just the total opposite. It's crazy the way it is. But he's saying here now, if you're a Jew, just because you say you're a Jew, uh, you've got to be a Jew of real life. You can't just have the title and not have the actions, not have the behavior. Heritage is not a guarantee of a good heart. And we see that throughout history in not just the Jewish rulers, but all kinds of rulers. Uh, one king would be great and do good things. His son would take over and he'd take the things in a totally different direction. What really had been a great success ends up being a total disaster. And so, well, yeah, of course, uh, it's the way it is in our own family sometimes. We hope all of our children will be good and better than we are, but sometimes that certainly is not the case. That's the human nature. Uh, individual has to choose to do right. It's not a guarantee that a child of a good person will end up being a good person. 
verse 28 through 29. It says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Though a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. And such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. He continues the argument that the heart change is what's important. The presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life makes a difference. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon a person and then it seemed like he would leave. But in the New Testament, we see when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, he stays there. But again, we go back to the issue that there are many people who seemingly are doing better things in the world than we as Christians are. But that would not justify them before God because Christ not being in heart. But certainly, we as Christians ought to be known for good works, as good as others, if not better. And of course, sometimes things that people do for other people that they see as being good really are not good for them. But uh, we need to be able to know the difference. Yet, in the society's eyes, those things would be justified. And I'll just take this as, as an example. In many places, they, there is a lottery. The lottery was instituted in the states, uh, for the, and they have a noble purpose for the proceeds. They say, I'll pick Florida for for one instance. They, they said the money from the lottery was going to be used for education, and who's not for education, especially for those who are underprivileged. But again, what happens is that uh, the lottery made people gamble. A lot of that money that was taken in. Uh, was used for the paying the salaries of those who were over all of that. A lot of the money had been pointed toward education and the tax code was taken away because they thought the lottery money would cover it. And then many people became addicted uh, to gambling and then there had to be law enforcement to overrule and control all that so forth. But it ended up being a cost more than it was a benefit. But society sees it as a benefit, as a good thing. And uh, so a lot of things mankind does that seem to be for good, according to God's will and to God's direction, are not good. And so this is the sort of thing we have. We as Christians need to know what is right for people according to God's word, even when sometimes it doesn't look right. We need to live that kind of a life and not support other things that are not that way. All right, let's look at our points to ponder. I think I got the right ones this time. Uh, let us see. Maybe I don't. Uh, it appears that I continue to put the wrong things in the wrong place, and I'm not sure why that is the case. But let me just see. Oh, there we go. Ah, there it is. The right spot now. Uh, family Christian heritage does not guarantee that you are a Christian. Of course, your mom, dad, grandchildren, uh, Christians, a great preacher in your history, your ancestry, doesn't mean you're going to be. You must choose individually. Vice versa, your family may have been horrible in terms of relationship with God. Does not mean you cannot be a Christian. You can become. It is a choice. You have the opportunity. You have general revelation. And then, of course, hopefully influence of Christians around you uh, guide you in that particular direction. Uh, Gandhi once said, it's my understanding, that he says, I would have been a Christian, but I knew so. That's a terrible statement. Certainly it should have been, I became a Christian because I knew so. Uh, that's been the continuing example in my life of people guiding me in the right direction because I follow good Christian people. Positive influences on me. There are some that aren't. Obviously, uh, you see all kinds of fakes around, but there are some good ones. And as you follow the good ones, and hopefully you are a good one, you will have a direct and positive influence on others. Secondly, uh, know, while you know what's right to do, described by the Bible, and you teach those other people, you must do that. Knowledge is good, but actions is important. Uh, and, uh, James, it says, he who knows to do right and doesn't do it is, is sin. It says faith without works is dead, being alone. That's Jesus' half-brother saying those sort of things. And, and it's true throughout the Bible, but those are just some very familiar places of Scripture where, where it's mentioned that way, as well as in this particular passage here. 
Uh, next thing is that the Christian misbehavior discourages non-believers from believing, and, and that is true. Uh, when we give in to temptations that, that God's hopefully able to keep us from, when we go in the wrong directions, other than the direction God sets, and, and we wonder, non-Christians wonder, why, why did we do that? How did we do that? Thought God was supposed to guide us? Well, it's because we, we didn't choose properly uh, to follow him. Again, God does not make us robots. Even though the Holy Spirit is in us as Christians and influences us and moves us in the right direction, we still can say no. Just as like you are your parent's child and, and they tell you to do what's right, you know what's right, you still can choose to do no, to not do it and to say no. And that's, that's what happens, unfortunately. Uh, and look at our country today. We, we say we are a Christian nation. Well, I'm not sure we're as much a Christian as, nation as we used to be percentage-wise. But even of that, those of us who are Christians, often don't set a good enough example to influence others to overcome the evil that's in the world, to take the strong stands for what's right and see that implemented. So, so that's where we are with that. And then the Holy Spirit resides in a Christian. If you go back to, if you go forward in Romans chapter 8, verse 27, it says that the Holy Spirit is in us interceding for us on a constant basis. But if you look back at Acts 1, 8, it says the Holy Spirit shall come upon the early church would come upon the Christian, would reside in a Christian. Uh, in 2.38, it says the same thing, the Holy Spirit is there. Yeah. Ephesians 1, verse 13 through 14, says the Holy Spirit is a deposit within us. In other words, we know he's there. It's our hope for the future because we have a part of God in us. You know, Ephesians 4.30 says the same sort of thing. So you look those verses up. But it reminds us that we have the Holy Spirit in us. As we ask God to help us and guide us, we can do what is right. He convicts us of sin, but also gives us the strength to do what's right. Uh, Romans 6 would deal more with the, with the uh, admonition that we must reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, choose what's to do right. We have that responsibility. God gives us the opportunity and the power to do it if we take the responsibility to choose properly. And he moves us in that direction, but we still can say no, and oftentimes do. And then the last question for us today would be, looking at what the Jews were accused of doing and not doing, uh, what about us? Uh, in the book of Amos, in chapter 7, God says, I'm putting a plumb line before the people. And a plumb line is something that's totally accurate, straight up and down. And you either can be the right or left of it, uh, but there's only one way to be straight with God, is to abide by that plumb line, to obey God in all that he does. Romans 12, and then when he's, We'll get to this one down the road, but I always like to read it again. It's a constant reminder to me, as I hope it would be to you, about what Paul says here. That's what we call one of the uh, verses on the, on the Roman road of salvation, where we should end up being, and move toward as we continue growth as a disciple. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Sometimes we wonder why things don't go any better for us than what they do. And sometimes it's simply because we're not doing what we're supposed to do, and that's why. The only way we know for sure God's complete peace in our lives and complete victory in things around us would be if we all would be completely in God's will, uh, living a, as living sacrifices for him. Now remember we talked early on that God is worthy of, of our giving our lives to him because what he has done through us, through salvation on the cross, the hope of eternity, and uh, the ability uh, to live in this world today because he's with us. Uh, never leaves us, never forsakes us, continues to guide us, and has given us direction. Oftentimes we don't do what's right simply because we don't want to follow the directions that we know that are there. Sometimes maybe it's because we haven't read the directions, but oftentimes it's more that we know the directions but want to do something different. I know it. as a man, when I receive something to be put together, my first thing is take everything out and look at it, see how I can put it together, and then go back and look at directions and see the right way. And that tends to be the case for all of us. We think we know better than the directions. We think we know better than God. The Jews thought they had it all figured out without asking God to continue to guide them and without being totally obedient to his guide. 
we all time as as men try to make up new rules uh, to make us better. And the fact of the matter is, it's simply a heart issue. We don't want to obey the rules we know. So we make up new ones to make other people maybe succumb to what we think is right, but also ways to get around what we already know is true. So I pray that's not the case for you today. Uh, again, our, our desire is to be Christians before people as God intends us to be. Not be like the Jews he was addressing here were, to say their one thing, but act and live totally different. Let us be different in our lives before others. That will cause some problems because you can convict people of their lies, things that they're doing wrong by you doing right. But that's, that's just the way it is. God it uses us, again, to help bring others to him uh, through the lives we live, either by convicting them or convincing them the right way to live. So I pray that you have great success in that in the days ahead. Let me pray for us. Father, we know, according to your word now, that all those who are in Christ uh, are together in the kingdom of God. Jews and Gentiles, you are your people if they've accepted Christ. And there's no favoritism toward anybody. And your spirit lives within us, uh, guides us and directs us as we continue to study your word and know what we're supposed to be doing, right and wrong. Lord, I pray to continue that you, that you move us to know what is right and what is wrong, but also to know that we have uh, the power through you to choose to do what's right. Let us be obedient. Let's not be given into this world, but let us conform to your will in our lives so we might be great influences in the days ahead. Father, you know at all times people need you, but especially at this time in our nation, you see so much turmoil. The question on us is, are there more atheists in America today than there are Christians? Well, don't know about that, but help them to know that we who are, are Christians, and obey you in desire to help others to become Christians also. Fix that hole in the heart, and let your spirit will continue to live in them, give them hope for the future as well as the present, and to live forever, and to be changed. So, Father, again, we pray that people will see that in us. They will become more like you through watching us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue in the book of Romans, a great book of study, a great book of application for all of us. Have a nice time.